My name is Jonathan Scott. I'm a professor of history at this university. Um, it's a great to see such a good turnout, and not surprising, uh, given our speaker. It's a very special pleasure for me to welcome David Armitage to Auckland to give the 2014 Keith Sinclair Lecture. Sinclair was the most gifted and influential historian to be produced by Auckland, and perhaps by New Zealand. And this is the first Sinclair Lecture to be sponsored by our new School of Humanities, comprised of classics and ancient history, history, art history, English, theology, and philosophy. I thank the school for its support for this event. I welcome its members, my colleagues, and I introduce in David someone more than capable of speaking to us, to us all. Let us celebrate the survival of humanities for the time being in New Zealand universities. I think it was JGA Pocock, another distinguished New Zealander, who described Massey University as instructing in, quote, humanities on the one side and bestialities on the other, unquote. <laughs> and it's the least we can do. I first met David Armitage at the University of Cambridge when he was a research fellow and I was returning to teach. Having completed my doctorate on the life and thought of a single person, I encountered David who had written his on the ideological origins of the British Empire. With his scholarship already bestriding the classical, early modern and modern periods, one knew that he was just gearing up after an assistant professorship and then chair at Columbia University, David moved to Harvard, where he's now Lloyd C. Blankfein, professor and head of department. A series of scintillating edited and co-edited volumes, accompanied by nearly 30 essays and a similar number of journal articles, consolidated his place as an authority on early modern literature and political thought, and as a leading scholar of British and then Atlantic and then Pacific history. The attainment by these footsteps of a global perspective was signalled by the Declaration of Independence, a global history, not by the actual declaration but a book about it, published in 2007 and since translated into six European and Asian languages, and then by another book, The Foundations of Modern International Thought. David's current project is Civil War, a History and Ideas, examining this concept from the classical period to the modern. Like the proverbial Roman centurion, David comes before us crushed beneath the weight of his honours. He has held 14 visiting fellowships in four countries, or five if Scotland becomes one. Uh, he's been elected to six learned societies and received many prestigious awards. He's given 28 named lectures in 10 countries if I let him onto the stage tonight. And finally, I come to what I most admire about David's work. He writes compellingly and beautifully, at a level rare in our discipline, even if it's not necessarily the case, as Germaine Greer put it, that, quote, most historians write like a horse's ass, unquote. And then there are his achievements as a teacher as a participant in discussions concerning the state and future of the field, and as an administrative leader. We've just hired one of David's students, and Ryan, you are, where are you? A sensational addition to history in Auckland. Our own Louis Gerdelan is now supervised by David and being led to even greater things. David's academic leadership is most obvious in his departmental chairpersonships at Columbia and now Harvard. But he was also, for several years, Director of Graduate Studies and History at Harvard, a huge and pivotal job requiring a deep commitment to training the next generation of historians. As for his citizenship, David has assessed for countless grants and fellowships and refereed for a staggering 36 journals and 27 publishers. Few historians obviously have this range, but my larger point is that David has not simply spent his time doing his own work. It is then as pretty much the complete package that I have the honour to welcome David Armitage to speak to us under the title, Horizons of History, Space, Time and the Future of the Past. David. 
Thank you so much, Jonathan, and thank you so much to everyone here for this very heartwarming and generous invitation. Uh, I visited Australia many times, but never New Zealand until yesterday, and I've had a very warm welcome despite the lack of very warm weather the last couple of days. Everyone assures me this is entirely unusual, uh, and it's normally like Southern California here all the time, so I'm prepared to believe that. I'll leave in a couple of days and the weather will become beautiful again. I carry a curse with me, I'm afraid. But it's really wonderful to be here. As Jonathan says, I have uh, many odd connections which have come together here. One, uh, actually, my very oldest friend, Ian Brailsford, uh, is here at the University of Auckland, I think known to many of you. Ryan has just arrived here as a lecturer. Uh, very proud moment to see you here, Ryan. And then, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, Louis Gerdelan, a very distinguished uh, graduate of this department, uh, just passed his exams. Uh, for those of you who know Louis, I can say he gave uh, one of the two best examinations, uh, graduate examinations I've seen in 25 years of teaching at Columbia and Harvard. So a real tribute to the training that students get here in the Auckland History Department. So it's a true pleasure to be here to meet many other uh, friends, old and new, and uh, to give in particular, the Keith Sinclair Lecture. I mean, it's an enormous honor uh, and a privilege to be invited uh, to stand on the shoulders of the many giants, including Jonathan himself, who've given this lecture uh, over the years, and also to speak in the memory of uh, Keith Sinclair, someone known, I think, very well outside New Zealand as uh, the, the historian who really uh, put New Zealand history uh, at an entirely new level, uh, both within New Zealand and for a wider readership as well, uh, raised it to new professional heights, and crucially put it into dialogue with other historiographies. There are many of these figures, and we could have a whole lecture on uh, figures, especially from the middle part of the 20th century, who had wide-ranging visions about their own national histories and wanted to write grand narratives for larger publics, uh, which we're also speaking to some of the major historiographical issues of the day as professional history really got going in the middle of the 20th century. And Keith Sinclair was certainly one of those characters who's clearly intellectually omnivorous, uh, read everything in many fields, and then brought those issues and those questions and those innovations in historical writing to bear upon the history of New Zealand in ways that both transformed historiography within New Zealand and then opened up New Zealand historiography for uh, consumption and conversation by other historians historians around the world. So it's a truly remarkable uh, achievement uh, and therefore a great honor to, uh, to speak uh, under his name, especially uh, since what I wanted to do today was to speak very broadly about uh, history across large expanses of time and also history across large expanses of space. So uh, I know there are many people in the room who uh, knew Keith Sinclair, and I hope uh, that he might have appreciated this lecture. I'm trying to uh, keep up with some current currents in historiography in the way that he did, but also to think in the broadest terms as he did as well. So I hope in some small sense this might be a tribute to uh, his extraordinary range as an historian, even though I won't be applying this necessarily to New Zealand history. Perhaps we'll leave that to the question session or even better, uh, the drink session, uh, which I gather will be lubricated by wine from the university vineyard. Uh, uh, even, even from Harvard, I'm deeply envious. Uh, we have a, uh, a defunct mine and a forest, but we don't have a vineyard. So lucky you to have a vineyard. Congratulations. Anyway, uh, as I say, I'd, li I'd like to think that uh, uh, Keith Sinclair would have approved at least of some of the themes that I'm dealing with today. And certainly uh, looking through his oeuvre and reading some of his uh, uh, essays as well as his major works, uh, it's noticeable that he, like so many New Zealand historians, is interested in, or was interested in, uh, large expanses of space um, the necessary way of thinking about New Zealand uh, as both connected but also disconnected from multiple wider worlds. And it was noticeable to me, uh, Jonathan and I were talking about this, uh, that five years before Geoffrey Blaney wrote his famous book, The Tyranny of Distance, about Australian history in relation to the enormous distances which separated but also linked Australia to the wider world. Five years before that, um, uh, Keith uh, Sinclair had edited a, a collection of essays on the effects of remoteness on New Zealand. And by a uh, happy coincidence, the, that set of winter lectures which he edited into that volume uh, had been inspired by Jonathan's own father, Harry Scott, uh, in, I think, 1959, and the lectures were given in 1960, the volume in 1961. And Keith Sinclair's own essay in that volume uh, is a very prescient, uh, witty, wide-ranging, somewhat outrageous, but very stimulating uh, reflection on uh, remoteness in New Zealand history and the way that was overcome over time, especially in the 19th century. And he does a wonderful twist in the essay, not to talk about remoteness, but about provinciality, about the cultural effects of distance. Distance, 
both in space and the way distance in space also turned into a kind of distance in time. He talks at one point in that essay about New Zealand in the 19th century is living in a kind of time lag. Um, a few months uh, in the latter part of the century, a few years in the middle and early part of the century behind the rest of the world, always getting the news, always drawing in ideas and people and innovations, but with a bit of a time lag. So very interesting, uh, very light touch that he had to deal with that nexus of space and time and how they interact with each other in the creation and the recreation of a colonial society. And I think that, uh, that deafness uh, with which he did that, the wit with which he did that, is not something that I can imitate this evening. But I'm interested in some of the same questions about how space space and time intersect with each other. And I also realized as I was going through Keith Sinclair's, uh, um, uh, Keith Sinclair's uh, bibliography that this is not the first time that his name and mine have been connected. Uh, I must have been very busy when I was about 12 years old because I'd completely forgotten that he and I had actually collaborated on a book uh, in 1977. Um, so uh, those of you who invited me this evening may have forgotten the fact that uh, we'd, we'd done this book together. So it's very nice to be here uh, again this evening uh, remembering, remembering this moment. Uh, um, the Reefs of Fire, as uh, some of you may know from your childhood uh, or even later, is Keith Sinclair's only children's book and it was illustrated by my namesake. Uh, David Armitage, the New Zealand artist who lives in Britain. Uh, I once got a very hefty uh, royalty check uh, from Murdoch newspapers that was meant for the other David Armitage. And uh, in my foolish honesty, I returned it uh, to, the, uh, to the Times newspaper. I probably should have kept it. But I think this is wonderful. Uh, I, was, I think perhaps I was meant to give this lecture just be, be, uh, because of this. So I, I'm just so delighted uh, to find that. Uh, the other connection I have with Keith Sinclair, and indeed with, with, with Jonathan and, and also with Linda, is that, as Jonathan mentioned, um, I've been chair of my uh, department. Uh, actually, I stepped down 21 days ago from that for a sabbatical before returning for a final year. Not that I'm counting, you understand. Uh, but in that position of two years as department chair, I was thinking a lot about the future of history um, in relation to my own department, thinking about the future of our graduate program. We also did a, a very big overhaul of our undergraduate program during those two years as well. Um, and that's one of the, actually, the, the pleasures, uh, if that's the right word, certainly one of the privileges of being a department chair is to think big about strategy for your own department and also one's own field. Uh, when friends ask me what it was like to be a chair, uh, I'd often refer them to the dictionary definition. Um, uh, a thing upon which people sit. Um, that was on the bad days. Uh, on the good days, I tell them it was a great chance to think very broadly, not just about the directions my own department should be going in the next few years, but also about trends in the field uh, and about the meaning of history as a, dis a discipline rather than as a metaphysical force, and also to think about the fate of the humanities, which I'll touch on in a moment, it's inspired by Jonathan's opening remark. Many of you, I think, will remember the benighted and bumbling head of department in Kingsley Amos's novel, Lucky Jim, who portentously answers his office telephone, history speaking. I can't claim to speak with the voice of history tonight, but I do want to reflect on some of the purposes of history as an academic discipline, especially in relation to its larger public mission as well. This is the chair that I was occupying, uh, uh, just to give you a sense of how that felt uh, for two years, and now I've been released from some of the, the bonds of that. Uh, one of the, uh, the interesting factors uh, uh, of my first year, at least, of chair, uh, of uh, uh, being chair, was the, the talk which was ramping up at that point, and it's, it's hardly died down since, about the crisis of the humanities, uh, especially in the uh, English-speaking parts of the world. Uh, Harvard had a task force on the crisis of the humanities at Harvard. This intersected with a broader discussion in the United States, which was also popping up in Canada, Britain, Australia, and I suspect here in New Zealand as well, about the future of the humanities. The motors of this current crisis are very different uh, in different countries, but uh, some of the same pressures seem to be, if not universal, at least repeated across large parts of the world. Sharply declining enrollments in humanities classrooms as against the social sciences and harder sciences. Uh, the controversial rise of massive open online courses, or MOOCs, which threatened to create, at least in the US, a hierarchy of institutions and to promote easily quantified subjects at the expense of those that can't be reduced to machine-readable responses. Shifting boundaries between scientific and non-scientific disciplines have opened up new possibilities for research and teaching, uh, but have also made, at least in the eyes of some, humanity subjects to seem perhaps quaint or even luxurious. <laughs> 
There are genuine concerns among students and their parents about long-term employability for arts and humanities graduates. And throughout, uh, again, the English-speaking world, ideologies of impact and relevance, uh, the managerialism uh, of governments as well as uh, administ university administrations, I think, has been weighing down on all of us increasingly over the past few years. And the squeezes on public and private university revenues that accompany uh, that, those moves towards managerialism have invaded more and more parts of our academic lives in recent years, fueling this, this broader sense of crisis. Battling these various challenges from within and from without the university itself can sometimes feel like a struggle against the many-headed hydra, a Herculean task and therefore somewhat heroic, but also unremitting because every victory seemed to bring with it a new adversary. These challenges affect the discipline of history as much as any other humanities subject. Indeed, as the great uh, um, American historian Lynn Hunt has noted in a forthcoming book, history is in crisis and not just one of university budgets. Uh, history is counted among the social sciences at my own university, but its patterns of enrollments over time have until recently mirrored closely those of subjects like English, French, or German, for example. One comparative example, advantage of being a historian in, the, uh, in this moment of crisis is perspective. We can see that there have been recurrent crises of the humanities over the past 50 years, and that the current one is nothing new, even if it has some novel features to it. Uh, interestingly, one historian who's been analyzing the data on uh, humanities enrollments, in particular in the United States, uh, has shown that some of the anxiety about shrinking class sizes is misplaced. So the, uh, the um, the image that you have here of declining enrollments has its baseline as 1970, and indeed there has been uh, a remarkable decline in bachelor's degrees in the humanities, this is just in the US, uh, since 1970. However, if you push the baseline back to 1960, in fact what we've seen is a reversion to the mean, that the number of humanities uh, graduates in the early 1960s was about the same as it is now. There was a bump in the 1970s and we've just gone back down there, so uh, this, this seeming decline may in fact be an illusion. Even more more interestingly, there's a very strong gender dimension, it turns out, to this alleged decline in the humanities. What the 1970s experienced was a larger number of women going into both universities in general and into the humanities in particular, and then over the years since uh, about 1975 or 1980, women going into the social sciences, the natural sciences, and to pre-professional degrees. So in fact, there hasn't been a decline of uh, humanities enrollments. There's been an increase of general enrollments, and then a flight of women from the humanities. So a uh, very interesting set, set of patterns, but with ultimately a reversion to the mean in terms of percentages of humanities graduates. So that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about the humanities, and it shouldn't uh, mean that we shouldn't be putting our best foot forward to encourage more students into our classrooms, and indeed, one of the major initiatives during my two years as chair was, as I mentioned, a big overhaul of the undergraduate program, and we managed to increase uh, this year uh, the number of our newly declared uh, concentrators, that's Harvard speak for new majors in history, by 50%. Uh, so we managed to buck the trend even as the other humanities departments continue their decline. I would not uh, tell any of the other department chairs in the humanities what our secret source was, because we are competing for many of the same students. But it was very uh, heartening to know that uh, with the application of uh, some real thought about curricula, and also by the astonishing innovation, which uh, uh, some of my colleagues in other departments simply couldn't understand, of simply asking students what they were interested in. Should I say that again more slowly? Asking students what they were interested in uh, really helped us to turn around this uh, decline and also to uh, do some very exciting things in our own classrooms. Despite some of, some of this good news, I mean, I think it's, and some of the reasons for not being quite so panicky about the crisis of the humanities, I think it's clear that the humanities throughout, at least again, the English-speaking world, do still perceive themselves to be embattled and are on, on the defensive. Um, and their met, uh, the methods of the humanities, uh, particularly, I, I would argue now, the long-term analytical perspective offered by history, can help us to identify what are the meaningful causes for concern rather than the merely misplaced ones. So uh, we can apply our own tools of analysis to really understand what's going on here and then to find solutions for those problems that can have solutions and to put to one side those things which perhaps shouldn't be worrying us quite so much because they're, uh, they may be secular trends rather than more immediate um, uh, uh, areas of, uh, of, of concern or areas of reform. What I want to do uh, this evening is, is to ask what we can do to snatch history from the bonfire of the humanities.
History understood as an inquiry into the past, and of course that word inquiry is the etymological root uh, of the word history itself, historia in Greek. Uh, history as a form of inquiry into the past has been pursued in various forms over the past 2,000 years. Um, it preceded the very recent confining of history into a professional discipline or an academic department, and of course has a very long pedigree within broadly classical systems of education across the world, not just in the Western world, from late antiquity to the 20th century. For much of that time, that is for much of the last 2,000, 2,500 years, history was a more or less practical pursuit, a guide to public life for rulers, their advisors, and citizens to provide philosophy teaching by examples, as one classical tag had it, or to be the guide to life, magistra vitae, as Cicero famously put it. History deployed analysis of the past precisely, therefore, to shape the future. It's only in the past century or so that history has gradually lost its public, future-oriented mission, though there are signs, which I'll come to at the end, that its vocation in a more critical, democratic, and even radical guise may finally be returning. History's place in public life remains fragile and uncertain to the point that historians now occupy, uh, at least in the United States, uh, very little place in policy debates, whether national, international, or global. That retreat to the margins is partly self-inflicted, partly the unintended consequence of professionalization, partly the result of more aggressive claims to influence by other academics, especially by economists also lawyers and some political scientists as well, who do have um, a ready uh, access to the organs of government and also the organs of governance on an international level. However, I believe that some of the damage that's done can still be undone. New directions in historical work can help to bring historians back into the marketplace of ideas, both nationally and internationally. History is broadening its horizons in space and expanding its horizons in time. Where once historians preferred the microscope, we're reaching again for the telescope. Landscapes as well as portraits are increasingly in the historian's repertoire, and the long shot is once more joining the close-up as a major perspective on the past. I would argue that no other form of humane inquiry is so well equipped to go wide and to go deep at the same time. And no other subject in the humanities, arguably no other academic discipline, has the capacity to be at once what I call transnational and transtemporal. Let me explain very briefly what I mean by those very pretentious adjectives. Transnational is now a widespread term of art among historians and indeed among other scholars. It in fact has a history going back at least to the mid-19th century where its origins can be found in comparative philology. Transnational study originally meant looking for commonalities and connections between discrete national languages. Over the course of the 20th century, the word had to be repeatedly rediscovered before it settled into current academic vocabulary. For example, international lawyers in the 1950s took up the word transnational to cover new forms of law, like the regulation of the environment, of disease, migration, crime, or of outer space that lay beyond state jurisdiction. That was transnational law as distinct from international law. And humanists and social scientists have found that word useful again in the last 20 years or so as a term of art for all the ideas, processes, and forms of activity, human and non-human, that do not fit comfortably within the political boundaries of nations or states. That's transnational. Transtemporal is a rather less frequently used word. I've actually appropriated that term from anatomy, where it means crossing the temples, traversing the temporal lobes of the brain. In the context of history, I want to reuse it to imply crossing time periods and traversing the conventional segments, often quite short segments or quite narrow ones, into which we historians conventionally slice up the past. Just as transnational history stresses linkages and comparisons across space, so we might say that transtemporal history deals with such connections across time. I'll give some more examples of this later, but transtemporal history can already be found in the idea of various long centuries, for example, the long 20th century, the long 18th century, even the long 13th century, I discover from medievalists, are all now very popular and fashionable. There's also the movement to erase the boundary between history and so-called prehistory. And there are various other species of long-range history, big history, 
deep history, the history of the Anthropocene, which I'll uh, return to briefly in the second half of my talk this evening. Transnational history rejects the national frame that structured so much historical writing since it became professionalized in the late 19th century. Transtemporal history revolts against conventional periodizations, especially those produced on the roughly biological timescales of between 20 and 50 years that characterized most historical writing since the 1970s. The first, I believe, captures the experiences of most of humanity more accurately than national history and also allows us to capture the non-human past at the same time through a transnational approach. The other, the transtemporal, presents now, I think, a more radical path for history in the future. Also a means to bring history back into some of the most pressing debates in the, in the present. Debates, for example, about global governance, about inequality, and the fate of the planet. The ability to be at once transnational and transtemporal may, in fact, be key to history's evolutionary ability to survive academic catastrophe. As the editor of the American Historical Review, the senior his, uh, leading historical journal in the United States, indeed perhaps in the world, wrote recently, quotes, to reflect in some manner on questions of scale in time and in space is clearly not new, but there seems to be a degree of urgency as well as self-consciousness that informs our interest as historians in the question of scale today that was not present before. That urgency comes, I will argue, from both within and outside the historical profession. This is the historical profession circa 1900, the uh, executive committee of the American uh, Historical Association, uh, very homogeneous in all sorts of ways, including sartorially, but there are other more obvious features about the, uh, the profile of the American historical profession at that point, rather like the European historical profession at the same time. As I think most of you will know, history writing, of course, became more than just the pursuit of interested amateurs in the late 19th century. It's from that moment that we can begin to speak, indeed, of a historical profession. Like any new profession, it consciously equipped itself with all the paraphernalia of prestige and exclusivity. It was about keeping more people out than it was about keeping people in, of course, like every professional structure. In the case of the historical profession, journals, professional associations, systems of gatekeeping and accreditation mechanisms like the PhD, all of which we still have with us today, but all of which are relatively recent within the history of history writing. More unwittingly, professional historians began to fit their inquiries into the most readily available container for them, the nation state. Professional history was born national and stayed that way for most of the time across most of the globe until very recently. Like most other social scientists and indeed many humanists, historians assumed that self-identifying nations organized politically into states were the primary objects of historical study. The main task for historians of these communities were to narrate how nation states emerged, how they developed, and how they interacted with one another. Uh, in this sense, uh, uh, Keith Sinclair was a classic professional historian. He unabashedly spoke of himself as a nationalist historian, someone creating a national history for uh, New Zealand. Uh, no shame in that. It was a typical uh, activity of national historians since the late 19th century. Even those historians whose work deliberately crossed the borders of national histories worked along similar lines and reaffirmed those borders between nation states. Diplomatic historians used national archives to reconstruct relations among states. Historians of immigration and emigration tracked the arrival and assimilation of new peoples into existing states and out of uh, other ones, of course. And imperial historians studied empires mostly as the extensions of national histories. In all these fields, the matter of history concerns stability, not mobility, what was fixed, but not what was mixed. In the last 20 years, historians have increasingly questioned the usefulness of these national frameworks for studying the past, moving towards studies they describe variously as international, transnational, comparative, and global. International historians often take for granted the existence of a society of states, but look beyond state boundaries to map interstate relationships, from diplomacy and finance to migration and cultural exchanges. Transnational historians examine processes, movements, and institutions that overflow territorial boundaries. For example, again, the environment, organized crime, epidemics, corporations, religious movements, and international social movements. Comparative historians deal with distinct historical subjects, usually but not always nationally or territorially defined in conjunction with each other, 
though not always on the basis of any actual historical connection between the, uh, the objects of comparison. And global historians treat the histories and prehistories of globalization, the histories of objects that have become universalized, and the links between sub-global arenas, such as the Indian, Atlantic, and Pacific Ocean, something I've dabbled in myself in recent years. The family resemblance that links these various transnational approaches is the desire to go above or beyond the histories of states defined by nations and of nations bounded by states. As we now know, uh, and as we should have known all along, most history, human and non-human, took place in spaces larger than or smaller than the nation state. To take account of that fact, we need to remove our nation uh, state shaped spectacles to understand the true shape of the past. This broader movement towards transnational history has encouraged historians to pay more attention to arenas that were larger than nations, like oceanic basins, for instance, those that were unconfined by the political boundaries of states, and those that were connected by transnational linkages and broader circulations. For example, most of the world's population for most of recorded history lived not in nation states but in empires, and here's a snapshot of uh, the zenith of empire around the turn of the 20th century. For a relatively brief period between the early 16th and the early 20th centuries, some of those empires were indeed, indeed the outgrowths of confidently national cultures, especially in Europe and Asia, but most were pre-national or supranational in composition. Oceanic spaces connected elements of many of these empires in the modern period, but maritime arenas such as the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic, the Pacific, also segmented sovereignties and became cockpits of inter-imperial rivalry. In the light of the long history of empire, the eternal world of states posited by modern conceptions of international relations, for example, seems fleeting, even marginal. By some estimates, a world of true nation states, detached from empires, emerged only at the moment of decolonization and was soon to be swept away by the wave of transnationalism that erupted after the end of the Cold War. It seems then that the heyday of the state lasted less than a generation from about 1975, if we take that as the peak moment of decolonization, to 1989, when after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the rise of the European Union and other transnational uh, organizations, uh, the state was challenged uh, from above as well as from below. Uh, I was in my teenage, and early, uh, teenage years and early 20s during those 14 years between 75 and 89 and completely missed uh, the heyday of the nation state. Though it was very clear, those of you who were around at the time studying history will remember that was the moment when histories of nationalism became most uh, uh, poignant and most focused on at that, at that point, I think as one sign of that interest in the nation and the state at that moment. Now, my own re re work in recent years, as Jonathan has mentioned, has tracked some of these developments in transnational history. Uh, my first book, The Ideological Origins of the British Empire, was on the history of empire and its relation to state formation in Britain and the Atlantic world from the mid-16th century to the mid-18th century and argued that the British Empire and the forging of the British state out of various nations, English, Scottish, Welsh, and Irish, were not conjoined but distinct process, were not distinct but rather conjoined processes. I argued that the British state, the early modern British state, emerged out of the experience of empire as much as the empire was an, an extension of the state, and that both were born amid international rivalries among European powers within Europe itself and especially in the Americas. My next book, The Declaration of Independence, A Global History, traced the emergence of a new state, or rather 13 new states, the United States of America, from the, birth, from the British Empire itself in the late 18th century. That book confronted a fundamental myth of American exceptionalism by showing how the US was born international and that the Declaration of Independence, that most American of American documents, was transnational in content, in form, and in impact across the two centuries and more since 1776. Uh, and I have a short passage in there where I talk about the impact of the US Declaration uh, in New Zealand, both on the, uh, the New Zealand, so-called New Zealand Declaration of Independence of 1835, and then, for example, in uh, Honeheke's uh, campaign, where at one point he uh, raises a flag, I think on July 4th, uh, as a way of showing his own independence uh, from the British. So the resonances of American independence um, traveled worldwide, and that's one of, uh, one of the things I trace in that book itself. By uh, focusing on a single text and its transnational fortunes, I was able to begin answering uh, what I think is a major question in uh, 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 modern history. That is, how did our modern world of states emerge from a larger, earlier world of empires? <clears throat> 
Most recently, in Foundations of Modern International Thought, published last year, I took that question further to ask, how did we, all of us in the world, come to imagine that we inhabit a world of states? I believe that feat of collective human imagination may in fact be the single most important shift in political consciousness of the last 500 years, bigger than the expansion of democracy, the rise of popular sovereignty, the spread of nationalism, or the proliferation of human rights. Because each of those other developments depended upon the creation of a world of states for its unfolding. I argued that it was in the early modern period, roughly between the early 17th century and the early 19th century, that what I call the foundations of modern international thought were laid down. In that period, states became the primary actors in world affairs, rather than corporations, relig religious organizations, trading companies, or even individuals. Those sovereign states um, operated under what international relations theorists called conditions of anarchy, that is, uh, self-organization without any controlling world government or other superior power. Because those states controlled who could and could not be recognized as a state, they created international organizations such as the United Nations to police the actions of member states of the club and also to uh, police access to that club with all other organizations outside the world of states deemed to be rogues, pirates, or failed states. Ideology and myth sustain, and indeed continue to sustain, that self-affirming international community. For example, the myth of a Westphalian state system that allegedly began in 1648. I think the historian's task, at least this historian's task, has been to puncture some of those myths by asking where they came from, what motives lay behind them, and how they became so central to understanding the modern world in its international form. Each of them had to be invented. The world of states is not a feature of nature. Each arose for quite specific reasons, usually the defense of new or embattled institutions against their competitors or their adversaries, and most turn out to be surprisingly recent. For example, the idea that the international realm is Hobbesian, a term often used in relation to international conflict, comes from the 1920s. It was not something that Thomas Hobbes himself believed. The myth of the Westphalian state goes back to the early 19th century, and the very idea of the international emerged only in the 1780s. That term was coined, actually, in 1780 by the English philosopher Jeremy Bentham. Breaking those myths and realizing how fragile many of our own presuppositions about international politics are can be salutary for questioning some of the assumptions of our political masters. For example, that the individual is necessarily subordinate to the state, that borders are impermeable, and therefore, for example, that immigrants should be kept outside them, or that there's such a thing as a national interest which trumps our duties of care for those beyond our frontiers. More generally, by seeing our own inherited arrangements as accidental and contingent, something we historians place, of course, a great deal of stress upon, we may be in a better position to question them and to imagine alternatives. That, I would suggest, is also a property of the more expansive trans-temporal history I've been sketching. Let me just turn to that now. Transnational history, I've suggested, is a reaction against seeing the past through nation-shaped spectacles. Transtemporal history represents a revolt against the equally constraining time frames within which most historical research and writing has been conducted for most of our lifetimes. I mentioned earlier Kingsley Amis' Lucky Jim, and those of you who uh, know that novel, especially those of you who are academics yourselves, will remember the academic article about which Jim Dixon, the nervous junior lecturer worried about his future, obsesses throughout the book. The famous title of that article is The Economic Influence of the Developments in Shipbuilding Techniques, 1450 to 1485. It was a perfect title, the narrator notes, in that it crystallized the article's niggling mindlessness, its funereal parade of yawn-enforcing facts, the pseudo-light it threw upon non-problems. Within a few years of the novel's appearance in 1953, however, an essay on such a broad and ambitious topic, covering as much as 35 years of history, would have been deemed almost recklessly foolish by any supervisor or advisor, and one would have been discouraged from uh, dealing with such a complex, uh, multi-causal, uh, uh, dynamic uh, subject over uh, 35 years. Indeed, for the best part of two generations, roughly between 1975 and 2005, most historians conducted most of their studies on timescales of between roughly five and 50 years, 
thousands of historical monographs, articles, and dissertations. Just think back to your own MA and PhD theses and first books. Uh, uh, testify to the constraint of biological time spans calibrated more or less, usually less, to the length of a human life. Just taking figures from the United States, the only area where we have fully, uh, full figures for doctoral dissertations that have been analyzed in this way. In 1900, the average number of years covered in doctoral dissertations in history in the United States was about 75 years. By 1975, it was closer to 30. Only very recently has it begun to rebound again to between 75 and 100 years. The shibboleths of specialism could be found across the pro uh, professional history around the world. A command of archives, sometimes the more obscure the better, total control over a massively exploding bibliography, and an imperative to reconstruct the past in ever finer detail by using the tools of microhistory and thick description forged by anthropologists before they found their way into the hands of historians. That contraction of temporal horizons, uh, again, roughly from the mid-1970s until the early 2000s, represented a relatively rapid retreat from what, in 1958, the towering French historian Fernand Brodel had classically called the long durée, uh, what we call in English the long durée. <laughs> Brodel was already world famous by that point in 1958 for his magisterial study of the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean world in the age of Philip II, of course, one of the most influential historical works of the late 20th, of the 20th century. He organized the Mediterranean famously according to three different timescales, told in succession as that book unfolded, a quasi-immobile history of human beings in their physical environment over geological epochs, a more gently paced, uh, lentement agité, history of uh, states, societies, and civilizations over centuries, even over millennia, and a more traditional histoire évenementielle, history of events, treating what he called those brief, rapid, nervous oscillations of events. The allegedly unchanging landscape, patterns of urban settlement, the eternal regimes of agriculture, all these were aspects of the long durée, as Brodel would term it 10 years later. Now, of course, as many of you will remember, Brodel's masterpiece was mostly written while he was interned in German prison camps between 1940 and 1945. As he later admitted, his reflections on the long durée uh, were in part an attempt to escape the daily rhythms of camp life and to bring hope by taking a longer perspective. Uh, hence, it's rather paradoxical that often in his works he talks about the imprisonment of the long durée, the impri uh, long durée itself as a prison for human uh, activity. But you can imagine him through the daily routine of the camp trying to think on longer time perspectives. Hope will come in the long term, even if day by day there seemed to be no hope in those years. When he explicitly launched the term long durée in 1958, um, he was battling uh, rather different enemies than his uh, German captors. Uh, indeed, uh, the original article in the journal Annal where he published it uh, was uh, the product of what he called a general crisis of the human sciences parallel to our current crisis of the humanities. And the nature of that crisis in the late 1950s as he perceived it was perhaps in some ways familiar. An explosion of knowledge, or as we might say, data. A general anxiety about disciplinary boundaries, a failure of cooperation between researchers in adjacent fields, and the stifling grip of what he called a retrograde, insidious humanism. Brodel lamented that the other human sciences had overlooked the distinctive contribution of history to sol solving the contemporary crisis, a solution that he believed went to the heart of the social reality that was at the, fo the focus of all humane inquiry, what he called the opposition between the moment and slowly unfolding time. Between those two poles lay the conventional timescales, uh, as he argued, used in narrative history and by social and economic historians, spans of 10, 20, maybe 50 years at most. Histories of crises and cycles along those lines, he believed, obscured the deeper regularities and continuities underlying the process of change. It was essential, he argued, to move to a different temporal horizon, a history measured in hundreds, even thousands of years, History on a long, sometimes very long duration. L'histoire du long, même de très longue durée. Brodel's motives for promoting the long durée was much institutional as intellectual. He just assumed the editorship of France's leading historical journal, the Annales, and also the presidency of one of its leading intellectual institutions, the sixième section of the École Pratique des Hautes Études in Paris, which became more famously the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales. From these lofty pinnacles, 
Brodel had to justify the primacy of history among the other social sciences, particularly against the claims of economics and of Levi Strauss's uh, structural anthropology. In that competitive institutional and intellectual context, where prestige and funding were at stake as much as professional pride, the historian's long durée was the alternative to mathematics as the key to integrating the human sciences, or so Brodel argued. He ranged l'histoire et von Montiel against the long durée, not because the history of events could only treat the ephemeral, what he famously called the spume and the fireflies of history, but because he believed it was also history too closely tied to events. In this respect, he argued it was like the work of contemporary economists, who he charged were harnessing their work as social scientists or human scientists to current affairs and to the short-term imper imperatives of contemporary governance, especially in the context of long-term reconstruction in France after the Second World War. Such a myopic form of historical understanding, he argued, tethered to power and focused only on the present, evaded explanation and causality, and was also, he believed, allergic to theory. In Brodel's view, it therefore lacked both critical distance and intellectual substance. His agenda also dovetailed very neatly with the rise of futurology, that forward-looking counterpart to the long durée on both sides of the Atlantic in the aftermath of, the world, of world War II. And there are, in fact, some very interesting um, uh, financial um, relationships between the funding of the, the Ecole des Hautes-Études in Paris and then uh, some of the new institutions of futurology like the Rand Corporation in the United States at the same time. So looking backwards a long way and then trying to look forward into the future were both common and indeed connected agendas in the 1950s when Brodel was writing. The two agendas were very closely intertwined with a long past giving substance to a potentially equally long future. In that context, I think it was no coincidence that the very term long range migrated from ballistics, think about long range weapons, to futurology, such as long range weather forecasting, and from there moved to history, the long durée, uh, a term that Brodel had picked up from uh, studies of long range unemployment, long, uh, long term chronic diseases, um, and also some from long, du long durée histories of property uh, in France, but he was the first to use it as a historical term of art. Now, as I've already said, within barely 20 years of the publication of Brodel's article in 1958, across most of the historical profession globally, there was a general contraction of temporal horizons. If we go back to the very beginnings of the American historical profession, just to, uh, uh, again to take that example, uh, look back at two of the founders of that profession, Frederick Jackson Turner and W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, Frederick Jackson Turner's doctoral dissertation was a study of trading posts across the whole course of North American history from the 17th century to the 19th century. And W.E.B. Du Bois's doctoral dissertation, which became his first major book, was on the suppression of the African slave trade from 1630 to 1870. Now, across the course of the 20th century, all of the newly professionalizing disciplines, humanistic and natural scientific, were anxious about the dangers of over-specialization. Uh, we can note, for example, the explosion of the use of the term knowing more and more about less and less between the 1920s and the 1940s. If you do a Google engram, no one uses that term by, before about 1920, but there's a huge explosion in mid-century, I think, with the professionalization of the sciences. If you do a similar Google engram for short-termism, that emerges about 1975 and then takes off uh, to become almost uh, a chronic disease by uh, the early 2000s. But it was only in the 1980s, I think, that is, after what I'm diagnosing as the retreat from the long durée, that worries about knowing more and more about less and less because of studying uh, narrower and narrower timescales became widespread in the historical community. So, for example, in his 1981 presidential address to the American Historical Association, the towering American historian uh, uh, Bernard Balin, uh, seen, seen here in a, a New York uh, Review of Books uh, caricature, uh, uh, observed uh, in his presidential address, quotes, um, that the challenge of modern historiography, his, as he called it, was to bring order into large areas of history and thus to reintroduce it to a wider reading public through synthetic works, narrative in structure on major themes. Because, he said, historical inquiries are ramifying in a hundred directions at once and there's no coordination among them. Just a few years later, the then young uh, British historian David Kennedy, here at the bottom, uh, uh, lamented that, uh, assailed what he called the cult of professionalism that meant more and more academic historians were writing more and more academic history that fewer and fewer people were actually reading. The result, he said, was that all too often the role of the historian as public teacher was effectively destroyed. 
Professionalization, he believed, and others made similar laments at the same time, had led only to marginalization. Historians were increasingly cut off from non-specialist readers as they talked only to one another about ever narrower topics studied on ever shorter timescales. The explanations for this retreat from the public sphere and the fear of long-term history were many. I've already mentioned the turn towards thick description imported from anthropology and the rise of microhistory with its concentration on specific events, peculiar individuals, and intractable documents. Add to these some broader factors, the so-called skepticism towards grand narratives that was the famous definition of postmodernism, the move of many adjacent disciplines from holism and synthesis to disaggregation and analysis. Think of the simultaneous rise of microeconomics or of analytic philosophy, for example, and a more general orientation towards the immediate, the present, and the here and now, all contributed to the centrifugal forces working against longer-term perspectives and the triumph of the short durée. Um, the American intellectual historian Daniel Rogers, in a recent book, has termed this the age of fracture, defined centrally as he sees it by the contraction of temporal horizons. In the middle of the 20th century, he wrote, history's massive, inescapable, larger-than-life presence had weighed down social discourse. To talk seriously, then, was to talk of the long-term, large-scale movements of time. By the 1980s, he, he went on, modernization theory, Marxism, theories of long-term economic development and cultural lag, the inexorabilities of the business cycle and the historian's long durée had all been replaced by a foreshortened sense of time focused on one brief moment, the here and now of the immediate present. The retreat to the short durée was not confined to social history or indeed to the American historical profession. At around the same moment in my own field of intellectual history, uh, the Cambridge historian Quentin Skinner, uh, seen here also in a New York uh, Review um, uh, caricature, was leading a charge among intellectual historians against various long-range tendencies in the field, for example, against the, so the so-called history of ideas associated with Arthur Lovejoy, the canonical approach to great books by which political theory was generally taught, um, and promoting in its place ever tighter rhetorical and temporal contextualization. Uh, this led to a contraction again of horizons in intellectual history, which are only now uh, being overcome. Now, of course, um, it would be fair to say that long durée history uh, disappeared entirely from the publishing lists of even university presses on both sides of the Atlantic. This is from a, uh, um, a Parisian travel company about you're going on a long trip, but uh, uh, this is the kind of travel I want to encourage in the closing, closing minutes of this talk. The combination of archival mastery, microhistory, and an em emphasis on contingency and context, powered by a suspicion of grand narratives, a hostility to Whiggish teleologies, and an ever advancing anti essentialism, determined an increasing focus on the synchronic and the short term. Questions of world history and big history only later began to widen the scope of historical study and to incorporate an environmentally minded retelling of history in which human events were contextualized against the longer life of natural processes. Technological factors have also begun to uh, bring us back to the long durée after this retreat for a generation or so to the short durée. Historians now have larger numbers of digitized and electronic archives at our disposal, and we have more tools to analyze them. We are now, as much as anyone else in the humanities or the social sciences or indeed in the natural sciences, custodians of big data, and the methods of digital history can empower even junior scholars, even undergraduates and graduate students, to attempt projects of a scope undreamed of and indeed actively discouraged by historians in recent decades. All of these factors have now begun to drive historians to consider longer and longer time periods. In the last decade, evidence for a return to the long durée can be found across the intellectual landscape. Just to give you a couple of examples, a Latin Americanist has recently noted of his field that quotes, it became unfashionable to posit theories about historical trajectories over the very long run, but he said change is now in the air. The long durée is back. A European cultural historian uh, told his colleagues at a conference, all of us are invested more or less explicitly in a long durée, in this case of sexuality. And a professor of American studies has recently remarked about her discipline. Anyone in literary studies who's recently looked at titles of books, conferences, research clusters, and even syllabi can't have missed two key words, long durée, re-emerging everywhere. Recent works have placed the Cold War and migration, 
the Black Sea and the Arab Spring, women's spirituality and the history of Austria, German Orientalism and concepts of empire into the perspective of the long durée. And even a cursory scan of new arrivals on the history bookshelves turns up a host of long-range histories of around-the-world travel over 500 years, of the first 3,000 years of Christianity, of genocide from Sparta to Darfur, and guerrilla warfare from ancient times to the present, of the very shape of human history over the last 15,000 years, and of strategy from chimpanzees to game theory. And I could give you another 20 of these books that have emerged in the last four or five years or so. Most of them are directed, of course, to very wide reading publics. So there is a direct relationship between these broad narrative spans and the attempt by professional historians in all of these cases, except I think for Max Boot, um, to reach broader audiences as well. Now, my own current research, which, which Jonathan briefly mentioned, on histories of ideas of civil war spans over 2,000 years from Rome to the present, um, ending up, uh, I thought it might be Iraq about five years ago when I started the book, then it turned to Syria. I think it's actually going to be Iraq again now. There'll be another civil war by the time the book is finished um, uh, in the next year or so. Uh, but what I'm trying to show in the book is how contemporary definitions of civil war necessarily breed conflict about conflict because they emb embody confused and often contested sets of conceptions whose roots in many cases go back to ancient Rome, to Roman law, to Roman history, to Roman oratory, and to Roman poetry. I'm arguing in the book that civil war resists definition because it has been through its whole 2,000 year history both evaluative and descriptive. It can't be abstracted and defined uh, precisely, but must be historicized. It's an indispensable term in our political vocabulary, but one whose application to events is never without controversy. That's in part, I argue, because the term civil war now occurs in both technical discourses and in non-expert speech. Any one of us might think that we know what a civil war is when we see it, but there are multiple communities of experts, such as international lawyers, political scientists, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and indeed politicians, who will always beg to differ about what is and what isn't a civil war. Think, for example, about the debates, about, of, of the debates over whether the violence in Iraq in 2005, 2006 rose to the level of civil war. And think of the more recent debate about whether or not the death toll in Syria about 18 months ago was approximating to the condition of civil war or not a discussion fraught with anxiety for Syrians themselves because on it depended the provision of aid and support by the International Committee of the Red Cross. And this does matter hugely. When the ICRC says a, a conflict is a civil war, it opens up possibilities for humanitarian aid and intervention which are not there otherwise, and also for the application or the non-application of different parts of the Geneva Protocols and therefore the possibilities for war crimes prosecutions at the end of any conflict. Civil war, I'm arguing, has always been an essentially contested concept and cannot be precisely contained. It's therefore a prime suspect for long-range, long-durée intellectual history, aimed at unsettling the certainties of policymakers, politicians, and journalists, not least, by adding complexity and historical depth to contemporary debates. But it's only one such object. A host of other trans-temporal long-durée intellectual histories are emerging now, of occupation and empire, of genius, of common sense, of public choice, of ambition and disobedience and many other central concepts. At least one historical field, my own field of intellectual history, is therefore overcoming its resistance to the long durée and other fields are already following. Indeed, Big is back across a spectrum of new and revived modes of historical writing. Grandest of all is Big History, an account of the past stretching back to the origins of the universe itself, to the Big Bang. More modest in scope, because including only the human past, is the still remarkably expansive deep history, which spans at least 40,000 years and deliberately breaks through the entrenched boundary between history and prehistory. More focused still, yet perhaps the one with the most immediate resonance for contemporary concerns, is the history of the Anthropocene, the roughly 200-year period, though its, bound, its chronological boundaries are contested, but let's say the roughly 200-year period in which human beings have comprised a collective actor powerful enough to affect the environment on a planetary scale. The timescales of these various movements are respectively cosmological in the case of big history, archaeological in the case of deep history, and climatological in the case of the history of the Anthropocene. Each represents a novel expansion of historical perspectives, and each operates on horizons longer, usually much longer than a single generation, a human lifetime, or the other roughly biological time spans that have defined most recent historical writing. 
taking into account these moves towards the expansion of historical timescales. Uh, I and a collaborator uh, have recently completed a book we're calling modestly The History Manifesto, urging a return to the long durée uh, in historical writing uh, as a means both of opening up our historical inquiries to return to the truly big questions, but also to bring historians back into the public sphere to debate these crucial questions of the crisis of global governance, uh, the dimensions of inequality, both within and between societies, and also to think about uh, the roots and indeed the responsibility for contemporary climate change. Uh, this uh, will appear uh, in October. The longer perspectives afforded by this new enlarged view of history have, I think, obvious relevance to our current situation. Since the Second World War, planning horizons and budget cycles around the globe have shrunk even more drastically than timescales of historians. Electoral cycles and models drawn originally from military strategy and economic forecasting have narrowed the focus of policymakers, politicians, and NGOs to periods of between one and five years. Uh, and of course, uh, most uh, global corporations work on quarterly reporting or at most annual reporting. It's little wonder then that global governance is in collapse, inequality within countries is rising, even as the inequalities between them are generally declining, or that climate change is almost certainly beyond any human remedy. All of those crises, of course, have deep roots, stretching back at least to the mid-20th century and the rise of modern international institutions, the late 19th century and the acceleration of capitalism, or the late 18th century with the beginnings of the conventional periodization of the Anthropocene. History is not, however, as some economists might tell us, reducible to path dependency. The future need not run in the ruts of the past. It is possible to jump the tracks and to take new directions just as it's feasible to go back through the past to discover the paths not taken. Only by scaling our inquiries over many decades, centuries or even millennia, and indeed on a planetary scale, can we hope to understand the, present, the, the genesis of our present discontents. And only by delving deep into the past can we hope to project ourselves imaginatively any meaningful distance into the future. As that great historian, indeed Nobel Prize winning historian Winston Churchill once said, the longer you can look back, the further you can look forward. For these reasons, I believe the future of the past is in the hands of historians. Armed with both transnational and transtemporal perspectives, historians can be the guardians against parochial perspectives and endemic short-termism. Historians were once called upon to offer their advice on political development and land reform, the creation of the welfare state and post-conflict settlement. Uh, and historians, along with other humanists, later effectively ceded the public arena nationally as well as internationally to the economists and occasionally to political scientists. When was the last time you saw a historian writing a regular column for a major national newspaper or being seconded to Downing Street or the White House from their academic post, let alone a historian consulting for the World Bank or advising the UN Secretary General? It's little wonder, then, that we have a crisis of global governance, that we're all at the mercy of unregulated financial markets, and that anthropogenic climate change threatens our seas and our cities, our food supplies and our water sources, political stability, and possibly even the survival of the, of, uh, the species, as well as many other species, of course, to mention just a few foreseeable but increasingly unavoidable consequences of short-termism. To put those challenges into perspective and to combat the short-termism of our time, we urgently need the wide-angle, long-range views that only historians can provide. Let me therefore end with an exhortation. Historians of the world unite. There is a world to win before it's too late. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.